Um, well, hello. First off, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. So excited to see everybody here for this special event. And uh, I also wanted to point out the fact that today is a special event for Louisiana history. It is, yes. Um, so on this day in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase was signed. Then nine years later, on this day again, Louisiana became the 18th state in 1812. Uh, so we are celebrating two very historical events. Louisiana's old state capital is a Secretary of State Museum under Secretary Nancy Landry. And it's our mission to help educate the public on Louisiana's rich history, as well as our democratic process. And tonight, I want to tell you a little bit about our new exhibit, as well as introduce you to our tonight's guest speaker, whose art is also featured on the walls outside of the exhibit. Patient No More, People with Disabilities Securing Civil Rights will be on display now through Saturday, May 25th. This exhibit focuses on the occupation of the federal building in 1977 by people with disabilities demanding access to public buildings. Patient No More details what led to this event and the civil rights victory that followed. We've also highlighted some local individuals who have contributed to civil rights and related causes along our gallery walls in this exhibit. Right outside the exhibit, we have the beautiful artwork of Catherine Clematis and are very happy to have her here with us today. Catherine is a New Orleans-based artist and designer who sold her first watercolor when she was 10 years old. As the daughter of veterinarians, she expresses her family's lifelong love for animals through her meticulous life-life paintings. She earned her BA from Loyola University in 2011 and today runs her multifaceted business K.A.K. Art and Designs from Home. Today, we welcome her to speak on her experiences overcoming adversity in life and finding her special something. Change the slide. Who do I ask to change the slide? Um, so you'll just say slide and he'll be able to okay. see you in there. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So slide. There we go. Raise your hand if you have ever broken a bone. Two bones, three bones, more than five. Okay, we got a few accident prone people in here. What if I told you that by the time I was 10 years old, I had broken over 500 bones? I had broken so many bones by that point that my parents and I just stopped counting. I'm here today to tell you a little bit of my story in the hopes that it will help you further your own story in a way that is meaningful, not just to you, but to those around you. I truly believe that everyone has something to give, something they can contribute to society. And it's just a matter of figuring out what that something is and doing it. But that doing part, doing it part, is key. Slide. Think about those you look up to. Maybe it's a celebrity, maybe it's a family member, or maybe a teacher or a mentor, someone who impacted you at some point along your journey. Why do you look up to them? You look up to them because they did something that you admire. You can be the smartest person on the planet or the most talented singer in the world, but unless you do something with those brains and that talent, it doesn't really matter. The one thing that drives me more crazy than anything in the world is when someone has the potential to do something meaningful with their life. And they don't do it because they're scared or they're confused, or maybe they're just a little lazy. They make up excuse after excuse why they can't, and then they don't. Slide. My name is Catherine Clomitis, 
and I'm an artist and graphic designer. I have a genetic bone disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, OI for short, that causes my bones to break easily and grow abnormally. I am obviously two foot seven in height, and I get around with the assistance of this electric wheelchair and an aid. Although OI does affect every aspect of my life, and I had to grow up a little differently than my peers, my parents always made sure that my life was as normal as possible. Slide. I went to a mainstream grade school, high school, and college, and participated in as many regular kid activities as I possibly could. I graduated summa cum laude from Loyola University in 2011 with a BA in graphic design. And today I run my own art and design business, Hack Art and Designs. Slide. So discovering my something. When I was young, my parents were constantly trying to find activities that I could do to keep me busy because I was smart and I was bored and I was driving them absolutely nuts. At five years old, my mom gave me my first watercolor set. You remember these, right? Every kid had one of these. Those cheap paints, they barely made a mark on paper and they came with a brush with plastic bristles and you used it on computer paper. Okay, well, I blew through that set in a week, as well as all the computer paper in the house. And it was clear at that point that I was hooked. Art would be my something. And it turned out that I was pretty good at it. Slide. My parents made sure that I was exposed to as much of the art world as I could be at a young age through art in school, private art classes, summer camps, any summer camp within a 30 mile radius. My parents made sure that I gained experiences in all types of medium, like acrylic and oil, printmaking, sculpture, and even glass blowing. But watercolor became my true love, slide. Growing up with two parents who are veterinarians, it's no surprise that my favorite subject was and still is animals of all kinds. I sold my first painting when I was 10 and I began painting pet portraits for my parents' clientele and earning money as a preteen. <clears throat> Along my art journey, I had a couple of amazing mentors that helped me develop my skills and my process and my style. I found that it's easier for me to paint while lying on my side because I can not only get into a position where my back doesn't hurt, but I can also rest my arm on my side and I can paint for longer in that position. The problem is that the world looks very different when you're lying on your side. Robin, perhaps my most influential mentor, actually would lay on the floor with me and see the world as I saw it. She helped me learn to compensate for the degree I was laying at. And she helped me learn how to draw more accurately. But she made me practice drawing straight lines without a ruler and per perfect circles like these without a compass over and over and over and over and over. And there were days, a lot of days, where I absolutely hated it. But it turns out that all of that hard work paid off because I know that without Robin's lessons, I would not be the artist I am today. And in between the technical drawing lessons, Robin taught me a lot of life lessons along the way too. I can still hear her saying, 
draw what you see, not what you think you see. And a good painting begins with a good drawing. But she taught me that life is not always as it looks at first glance. And sometimes it's important to take a closer look before you judge. She also taught me that you have to put in the time and the grunt work if you want to be successful at anything. So while my friends were off perfecting their various sports moves, I was in my studio drawing circle after circle and line after line. And I learned that art is not always fun. But then again, nothing worth doing in life is always fun, right? I worked hard and it paid off, but Although art started as a hobby for me, just something literally to keep me occupied, it soon turned into a passion and eventually a source of income. Art gave me something to share with society, something that made people happy, and it gave me a way to earn a living, even though I have kind of a unique physical disability that most people don't. I found that while there are a lot of jobs I can't do, I can create art and I can do graphic design and I can earn just as much or sometimes more money than my able-bodied friends. In this way, art gave me a sense of independence and that's something I'd never really had before. It was hopeful for my future. Slide. My grandparents started hosting art and jewelry parties for me in their home when I was 15. And I later built my business around that model, bringing my art into other people's homes. Kind of like a Tupperware party, but with my art and jewelry. Does anybody remember what Tupperware parties even are? Okay, okay. I say Avon sometimes, but nobody knows what that is anymore. Anyway, um, even though art is... No longer something I would necessarily say I do for fun or just because. It's opened up more opportunities for me than I could have ever imagined as that five-year-old with that super cheap watercolor set. But when I do talks like this one, the question I get asked most often is something along the lines of, what keeps you going? How do you always stay so positive despite all the challenges you face every day? The fact is adversity and struggle strikes everyone at some point, although in different ways. But what happens when life happens? How do you not, not just fall in a hole and give up? Well, the short answer for me is that my mother never let me feel sorry for myself, even on my worst pain days. She and my father never enabled me. They taught me that I had a choice about how I was going to participate in life. I could either learn to live with this disease and lead a pretty good life, or I could be perfectly miserable all the time. And I learned very quickly that misery is boring. And we've already established that I don't like being bored. So I do try to maintain positivity, slide, like this sheep, which hopefully is going to change in just a second. There we go. Like this sheep I'm, at all times. And that's not to say that I don't have bad days and that I don't ever have moments of feeling sorry for myself. There's never a point in any day where I don't hurt somewhere. Pain is just a constant force in my life. And if you have a chronic condition or have had a long-term injury, you understand that sometimes it just feels good to wallow and throw a hissy fit, right? But at a certain point, as my mother says, you just have to put your big girl panties on and deal with it. 
because otherwise you are not going to get anywhere. But to me, life is more about how you deal with the challenges you face rather than the challenges themselves. The choices you make about how you live is really what determines the path you follow in the long run. And although sometimes your challenges might get in the way of finding your something, I've found that once you find your something, it's easier to deal with your challenges. But art has always been the something, that one constant I could turn to throughout my entire life. But it shouldn't come to as a surprise to you that my college application essay was titled, My Life is a Physics Problem. <laughs> my parents and I constantly had to adapt the world around me into one that would allow me to complete what seems like ins insignificant everyday activities. I function best lying down. So I often lay down to eat, to drink, and even to ride in the car. I have a large countertop in my bathroom so that I can lay down to brush my teeth. I write and I type one-handed pretty quickly, by the way, and I paint lying down. When we were younger, my cousins and I even developed our, our own version of hide and seek where my older cousin would hide me and my younger cousin would have to find me. And that was a lot of fun until the day I spent an hour in an underwear drawer. So because I function differently than most people, I've had to deal with strangers making assumptions about me just by looking at me for my entire life. At first glance, most of the time people think I'm mentally disabled or I'm deaf because I'm in a wheelchair. Now, I do have some hearing loss, don't, don't get me wrong, but I have never understood the connection between being deaf and being in a wheelchair. But that's, that's beyond me, but, but then they're staring. <laughs> and it doesn't bother me when kids stare because they just haven't been around people who look different than them and they don't know how to act around them yet. And I love it when they come up and ask me questions, happy to answer all of them. But when adults stare, <laughs> that's when I get a little annoyed. And my favorite thing to do is to stare right back at them and make them just as uncomfortable as they make me. And I love watching people's awkward reactions because they can be pretty hilarious sometimes. I mean, you've got to have a little fun, right? Occasionally, but I get comments. Is it? Yeah, okay. I get comments all the time from strangers like, oh, look at that cute little baby. Or isn't she just precious? Which is not what a 30-something-year-old really wants to hear. I'm going to give you a speeding ticket. Do you have a license to drive that thing? Those get really old, too. I can pretty much guarantee you that anyone who uses a wheelchair for mobility will tell you that those phrases are not cute, clever, or original. And we've heard them a gajillion times. I have even had random people want to do things like pet my head or give me a kiss. Personal space, it's very weird sometimes. But, but this is how my life is on a daily basis. And these are some of my challenges. Whether it's being a victim of stereotyping for whatever reason, losing all of your possessions in a natural disaster, the loss of a parent or a family member, financial stress, a physical or mental disability, caring for someone who's sick. Everyone has challenges. And everyone has to figure out how to live despite these challenges. 
bad things happen no matter what you do, but it's how you deal with them that determines the course of your life. Slide. When you find your something or your purpose, then it's easier to deal with the bad and create the good because you already have a reason to want to live. It gives you structure, a focal point from which to build your life around. When bad things happen, your somethings will be there to help you move forward. It it's what gives your life purpose and meaning. Everyone has something to contribute to society, but the trick is finding yours. What's that one thing that makes you tick? What do you love more than anything else in the world? Is it being a good parent or mentoring kids? Do you want to discover a cure for cancer or create a device that will allow us to teleport? Because I would love it if somebody did that. Are you happiest when you are sharing your gift of music or art? Are you the compassionate one of your friend group and you enjoy being the resident caretaker? Or maybe you strive to teach others how not to be by letting them learn from your mistakes. Fun. If you don't think you found your something yet, I encourage you to find activities that interest you and try them. Take a couple of risks with, within reason. Of course, I did not tell you to go jump off a building or anything, just within reason and figure out what you're passionate about. Remember, you never know who you're going to meet and what opportunities may fall into your path unless you get out there and you be brave and you do something. I never would have dreamed in a million years that I would get to work for Sir Rod Stewart one day. But a series of unlikely events connected the two of us on a very hot and sweaty day at Jazz Fest, actually six years ago yesterday. And we are still in touch today. But I have found that perseverance plus passion equals success and satisfaction. Finding my something not only gave me a career, but it gave my life purpose and meaning. Imagine what the world would be like if everyone contributed their somethings. Imagine how rich and positive life would be. So here's the challenge I'll leave you with, Fun. If you don't think you found her something yet, when you get home tonight, schedule that art class you've been meaning to try or join that book club that your friend keeps recommending. Volunteer in your community on your days off. Adopt a shelter dog. Unless you have five like me, then don't adopt a shelter dog. Try something new to open up your world and bring you new opportunities. How many of you are thinking right now, boy, I wish I could draw and paint like that. Anybody? A few people, okay. But you know what? Everyone has their something. And just because creating art isn't yours, it doesn't mean that your something isn't any less, is any less important than mine. Do things in your life to help you find yours. If you think you found your something, share it with the world as much as you can. Find ways to interact with those around you. You never know who you're going to meet, whose life you will change, and who will change your life until you get out there, you get brave, and you do something. Thank you.
So I think we are doing questions. Yeah, you can move it. Ah, some of you know me, so I'm kind of scared of what questions you're going to come up with. <laughs> har, har. Okay, there we I'm go. I'm a little All nervous right. about that. Yes, yeah, so we're definitely going to uh, open the floor to questions. I'll start. <laughs> um, so I love art too. I love animals too. Um, and I was wondering when you were younger, was there any animal in particular that really got you started like a, like a cat or a dog or a bird? Started painting? Mm -hmm. Um, no, I mean, the first, the first paintings I remember doing were one of our, fr our family friends at the time, um, knew that I was starting to get into art and actually gave me real watercolors. And um, she had me paint our four cats for my parents for their anniversary. So I remember painting them um, and actually miraculously, they were hanging in my mom's office during Katrina. So we actually still have those, which is nice because we don't, don't have a lot of my younger art anymore. But um, I mean, I had a dog when I, I got her when I was 12 that was special. I mean, I I wouldn't say she necessarily propelled me along my painting career, but I, I got I had an Italian Greyhound when I was twelve that was like mine, you know, my first dog. But yeah. Yeah. I think I saw some jewelry in there. You did. So tell me about that. So when I was about fifteen, um, it was it was pre-Katrina. Yeah, it had to be. So when I was about 15, um, my, my dad had a, a lung disease, a genetic lung disease that caused him to have to retire and have a double lung transplant. And so when I, he was home a lot and he had, you know, a, a whole slew of clients, right? And he tried to stay in touch with some of them. So one particular client, um, her name is Ellen and she's one of my best friends now, but she, uh, she's funny. She, she has a very big personality, but she's an artist among other things. And she told dad, yeah, I just started making jewelry and I don't know exactly how they got together, but somehow she showed him some of her designs and it was not something I had really done yet. And I was still kind of in that stage where I was trying to figure out what, medium I was going to do and he brought her over one day I was doing homework after school and he said Ellen's going to teach you how to make jewelry and I'm like okay so um but then she did and what's funny about this whole situation is um Ellen is 83 and I or no I'm sorry she would kill me if I said that Ellen is 81 her sister is 83 she would kill me for that um Ellen is 81 and I'm 35 and like we click really, really well. Um, and so she taught me all about the stones and how to put stuff together. And we learned new techniques together. And my grandmother is, was very big into jewelry. And so she started seeing me doing this and she said, oh, let's throw a jewelry party in my house. And so she would invite in New Iberia, she would invite her group of friends, which is a relatively large group of friends that were to the house. We would have wine and cheese and whatever. I mean, I wouldn't, I was 15, but they would have wine and cheese and whatever. Well, yeah, it, we won't go there. Um, and, um, and they would buy stuff and it was great. And that, that party, that jewelry party ended up getting so big that I had to, I have to move it to a gallery now. Like we can't have it in my grandparents' house anymore because there's so many people that want to bring people that we don't know. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think we're gonna do that in my grandparents' house at this point. Um, but yeah, that's how I got started. I I tell people like, I enjoy making jewelry. It's not my focus because I feel like, I mean, it's stringing beads together, right? So if you learn the rules of jewelry, and learn what looks good and what the stones are and all that. I feel like most, that's something most people can do. 
but not everybody can paint like I paint. So like for me, my focus is on my painting, but I like to do jewelry, especially around Christmas because, you know, it sells. <laughs> I mean, it sells and people like it. And it's something, I, I like the idea of using art. Like I like the idea of, it doesn't have to just be on the wall. You know, it can, you can use it, you can use it for towels or pillows or whatever. You can use it in your home in any way. So, yeah. So your degree was in graphic design and yeah. arts. Yeah. You've had to learn a lot about business. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes, I wish I had learned more in college. Um, so now Loyola has changed their curriculum to include business classes because that was my whole class was like, I mean, we didn't learn how to do contracts. We didn't learn. I mean, you know, so when you start a business and then you're thrown into that, that's kind of scary. Um, now, I had two parents who owned their own businesses. So I was very lucky because when I graduated, I mean, before I even graduated, my dad was like, okay, we're going to see a lawyer. We're writing up an LLC. This is what you're going to name it. Sign here, sign here. All right, we're done. I'm like, okay. I have no idea what any of that means, but okay, whatever you say, you know? Um, so I was lucky because I had parents who have done it, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have learned as I went, let's put it at it. And I've learned that your best bet is to get good people on your team, you know, good bookkeeper, you know, the things you're not good at bookkeeping, CPA, you know, lawyer, those those kinds of people, good people to have. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Actually, I have two questions. Okay. I noticed that you paint left-handed. Wait, I'm I am having trouble here. And uh, do you do you paint left-handed? I do. Are I you left-handed? Left okay. Yep. Super. Um, the second question I had is the the lamb. What that it was on the wall. Uh huh. The sheep. Is it a sheep or a lamb? Is, yeah. is there any special thought process or was there a model or you just um, you just got that in your head? No, 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 no. I'm not that good. No, I, I no, no. I, I usually work on photographs. So at some point I saw a photograph that I really liked that was, I'm sure something close to that. Um, and, or, I mean, I mean, I assume it was close. I don't, honestly, I don't remember. But I'm sure there was a photograph that inspired it that I went with. Yeah. And the message behind that? Huh? The, what, the message that oh. you wanted to send is, is sort of whimsical. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, what's funny, so what's really funny is I did that right before COVID. And during COVID, I sold masks, like cloth masks with my paintings on them. And that one was the most popular because the lamb is like sticking its tongue out and you know, it's just fed up with life. And that was such a popular mask. It was great. And everybody feels like that sometimes, right? I mean, fed up. Yeah. Yeah. Make it, that painting makes me laugh every time I see it. I like it. Question for you about when you first began. I'm, I'm the mom of a very talented artist and mom has no artistic ability. <laughs> but do what to it for any of your original works? Are there things that you get so attached to that you can't part with? My are, are my son is a very talented artist, but he doesn't. Give oh up no, his work. So, every, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 for the right price, I mean, everything's for sale, right? Um, that's that's. I mean, okay, I have one painting in my house really my mother gets attached that's really the problem um I have one painting in my house that is called identity and it's actually a um I have prints of it on my Etsy store if you go to it but it's um 12 it's actually 12 square paintings that are framed together and it's different animal eyes so it's like I mean it's like an elephant and orangutan a zebra a frog a squid like it's yeah it's a bunch of bunch of different ones um and it's just a good it's a good painting like it's one I really really like um I would say every series I do there's usually one that I really like I did sell 
So my, you know, I did sell my favorite out of the last series that was in the West Baton Rouge Museum. Um, it was hard to let that one go, but I, but I did. And I know the person who bought it, so it's okay. The octopus, that was one of my favorite. It turned out, I had prints of it up here. Um, it just turned out really good. It was just a really good painting. This series, so right now I'm working on a series of all Louisiana animals. Um, and that's going to be hanging at the conservatory in um, Thibodeau in September. And so I, I don't know if I'm like, my mom is attached. Again, like my mom is attached to some of them and has already said, yeah, pick a frame that matches our house for that one. I'm like, okay. And I've told her, I'm like, one, you get one, but there's going to be 50. I don't care. You get one. Um, so we'll see if she changes her mind by the end. But yeah. Second question. Are you hypercritical of your own work? Again, my mom is hypercritical of my own work. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, yeah, to an extent, to an extent. I mean, I see things that other people don't, you know? So like there are paintings I've done where people have said, oh, it's so good. It's so good. And I've just left it because so many people like it. But now every time I see it, I'm like, oh, I should have fixed that. I like, why didn't I fix that? You know, but, um, no, I, I don't let, so, okay, so this is funny. My my mother's veterinarian. So she's very good at animal anatomy, right? And knowing what things should look like. And she always tries to explain things to me like, don't you see, this is the bone structure and this is the muscle that connects from here. I'm like, no, because I'm not a veterinarian. Like I see dark and light, you know, and I see smooth and rough. Like I don't, I don't see it like you see it. And so I don't let her look at my wild animal art until it's done. And I never let her compare it to a photo, ever, never, ever, because she will nitpick it to death. But because the point of those is not to look like a photo, right? The point of those is to just be a good painting. But when I'm doing pet portraits, I do have her look at those because I feel like if somebody's commissioned me to paint their pet, it needs to be right. You know, it needs to be their pet. And so she's really good at that. And I, I, I deal. There are times, though, where I say, well, that's not changing. That's just going to stay like that. Sorry. I know you see it, but I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I did that actually last week. I was like, no, nope. no. Nope. She felt like Catherine had the color wrong. So when the, the client would come in, she clipped the hair and bring it to Catherine. Oh my God. Yes. And which doesn't really help. I mean, when you have a little bit of hair off the dog, like it, it's not the same as looking at the hair on the dog. You know, I'm like, mom, this, this is just weird. Like this, this doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's tough sometimes having a vet as a mom when she's critical about my art, but yeah, she, I did, there was a pelican I just did for this last series and, um, it's in an odd position. Okay. Like it's not something, and I like it because it's in an odd position. It's not something typical you see. And she looked at it and she goes, they don't do that. I'm like, yeah, they do. And she's like, no, they don't. I said, I'm going to show you the photo. So that one, she saw the photo and she had to go, okay. Yeah, they do. I'm like, yeah, see, I told you. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any other questions they'd like to ask Catherine? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I was just going to share a story and I don't know if I've shared this with you or not, but I thought about my dad today walking up this hill because when he was 54, he and my mom were walking up this hill to go to like Best for All. If anybody remembers Best for All, oh, yeah. when he got to the top, he was really winded and he's like, I think we need to go home. And that's when we realized something was wrong. He started seeing doctors and oh. he found out he had had a neck cancer, oh, which geez. soon went to him talking with a little thing. 
and just when you talked about the staring, it just really made me think about him and how, like, he was so good about it. Like, you're so good about it. And I just, I guess I wish the whole world would think about that. But if he walked into a restaurant and people were staring or with kids, he had the biggest heart for kids. But no matter who it was, he would just walk past them and would twinkle in his eye and go, lost my voice in a poker game. <laughs> and that diffused everything, you know. That's great. <laughs> so anyway. I just That's awesome. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. 